This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church, where our mission includes a loving God, loving neighbors, and living with purpose. You know, when I was a pastor here, uh, you had to be present, physically present, here in the sanctuary if you were going to participate in our worship. But these days, you have a number of options. Of course, you can still come and uh, join us here in person. If you're unable to attend, uh, you can live stream the worship service by accessing First Presbyterian's worship site, as no doubt some of you are doing right now, and as Janet and I have done in the past when we could not make it. Or you can catch this week's service next week on WIBW uh, channel 13.2 or channel 11 for Cox users. Our worship services uh, are uploaded to Facebook on Sunday afternoons, and YouTube videos uh, have them of past Sundays. So and then, of course, there's the old standby. You can stop by the church office and, and get a DVD or a recording of it of some kind. So no excuses for missing worship at uh, First Presbyterian. We got you covered, I think. Uh, I'm wearing this stole this morning, actually, in honor of Suni Lee, who represented uh, the United States at this year's Olympics. Uh, as one of our outstanding gymnasts, uh, she won the gold first place medal in the all-round uh, competition. Sunni's parents are Hmong, uh, refugees from uh, Laos. Her grandfather actually having fought alongside American troops in the Vietnam War. And because of their American uh, pro-sympathies, uh, why the Hmong escaped persecution, many of them, by immigrating to the United States and to other Western countries. This stole was actually given to me by Janet's parents a number of years ago, uh, and it uh, actually was made by Hmong, and who are known for their excellent weavings. So it's interesting how our crafts and our worship can connect with people all around the world. For those of you who may not uh, know us, I'm Neil, and this is Janet Weatherhog, whom you will meet in a moment. I retired as this uh, congregation's pastor back in 2005, and am pleased to stand in for Sandra today and again next Sunday. She's taking some uh, time off for continuing education and for time with her daughter. Uh, Pat Yancey, as many of you know, uh, spent this last week with our youth helping uh, to take down and get it ready for the winter Heartland Presbyterian uh, Camp in Pikeville. So we're glad that you're here today and are joining us in worship. So now let us worship God.
Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. O oh God, our creator and our protector, how wonderful your name is everywhere on earth. Your magnificence is displayed throughout the heavens. The voices of children and babes announce your presence. which you created. Overcome by the celestial brilliance, we wonder why you care for us mere mortals. You honor us by entrusting to us the care of your creation. O oh God, our God, how wonderful is your name over all the earth. Please join me in using the opening prayer printed in your bulletin. Let us pray together. Variety and richness of your creation. We pray for your wisdom for all who live on this earth, that we may wisely manage and not destroy what you have made for us and our descendants. Hear us now as we join our voices to sing your praise. seated. If we claim we have committed no sins, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. On the other hand, if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us. As we humbly come before the God of grace, we confess our sin against God and our neighbor. Let us join together in the prayer 
of confession. We confess, O Lord, that we have gone astray like lost sheep. We wander in a desert devoid of meaning, oblivious to your presence and your care for us. We seek pleasure for ourselves and ignore the needs of others. We give lip service to our faith, then live as we choose to live, not as we ought to live. Forgive us and restore us to an awareness of your loving purpose for our lives. We continue in silent prayer. and the assurance of our pardon. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Therefore, I am able to assure you that in the name of Jesus Christ, we are loved and we are forgiven. Amen. Good morning, young disciples. Isn't that what Pat says? I, I don't do it as well as he does, but anyway, I wanted to get the words right if I could. So, Anyway, I want to talk to you about a couple of scriptures that we'll be listening to this morning. There are two stories. One is from the Old Testament. One is from the New Testament. And they both are about, well, young people. In the Old Testament, we find young David with his trusty slingshot who fells this giant Goliath. And I suspect most of the children here remember that story from Sunday school. Over in the New Testament, we run into, well, this fellow doesn't have a name. We simply call him the prodigal son. In other words, the wayward son, the stubborn son. He was the one that grew up probably into his teenage years and then decided, you know, I'm kind of tired of hanging around home. So he went to his father and said, Dad, uh, would you give me my share of the uh, inheritance and I'll see you later. So the father was good enough to distribute some of his inheritance to him and to his other brother, his older brother. So the young man went off and uh, lived it up someplace else in what we call desolate living. He just had a grand old time. Unfortunately, he burned right through his inheritance. And about the time that he did that, well, a big famine hit. And there wasn't enough food for everybody to eat. They needed to find a job so that he could eat. Well, the only job he could find was out feeding some pigs. And he did that for a while, and he got very, very tired of feeding pigs. And so he thought to himself, you know, I get treated better than this at home. I think I'll just pack up and go back home and hope my father will accept me. And so I picked up this little book that we still have at home called The Boy Who Ran Away, and it says, he went home, but his father saw him as soon as he got near the house, and he ran out and kissed him because he was so glad to have him back. Well, the son was ashamed to be treated like an important part of the family, and he started to say that he could only be a small part of the family now, just a servant. But his father didn't listen. He was too happy. 
he sent for the best clothes to dress him, to welcome him home. And he threw a great big party for him, dancing and lots to eat. And he said, my younger son is part of the family again. This is a story that Jesus told to a lot of people. And it reminded me of God and how he treats us. You know, we mess up, we ask for things to take advantage of them and run away, and eventually we realize the foolishness of our actions and we come back to him, and God is always there, ready to forgive us and welcome us home. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples and others, that God is always there waiting for us. Thank you. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also freely and joyfully respond through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. On page 78 in your pew Bibles, you will find the scripture for today. Our first scripture reading comes from the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and it is the familiar story of the prodigal son. Let us listen for the word of God. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided the property between his two sons. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in wrongful, sinful living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him out in his field to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything to eat. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and he put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring a robe the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and prepare it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Here ends our reading from the Gospel 
according to Luke. Few characters in the Bible led a more interesting but tragic life than David. It all began in his youth as he felled Goliath, the giant Philistine warrior with nothing but his slingshot. Well, after that story, what most people remember about David is his affair with his neighbor Bathsheba. David, by then king of both uh, Judah and Israel, got up from his nap one day and went up to the roof, as was his custom. And as he walked about, he saw this beautiful woman taking a bath next door. The bather, of course, was Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, a commander in David's own army. David was determined to have this woman to be his very own. After all, he was king, and kings get what they want when they want it. Well, first he seduced her. Then he arranges to have her husband killed in battle. David's flagrant sin did not go unnoticed. Nathan the prophet confronts David and accuses him of murder, uttering, those unforgettable words, you are that man who sent Uriah to his death. Well, like father, like son. Years later, David's firstborn, Amnon, became enamored with his half-sister Tamar, and then Amnon seduces her and rapes her. This angers Tamar's brother Absalom, who stalks and eventually kills his half-brother Amnon, thus avenging his sister's rape. Not knowing how his father might react, Absalom flees and remains in exile for three years. Shades of Cain and Abel, brother killing brother. We hear nothing of David's reaction to the rape of his daughter Tamar. He mourns only for Amnon. Tamar seems to have been forgotten. Nevertheless, David does miss Absalom, grieves for Absalom, longs for Absalom, but does not, does nothing to forgive or reconnect with Absalom. So Joab, David's commander, concocts a plan to bring Absalom back. And it works. Absalom is invited to come home. Ah, if only the drama could end on this note of reconciliation. Shades of Jesus' parable of the foolish and and desperate son who has wasted his inheritance and returns home with his head hung low. Yet the father in that story welcomes his son with open arms, telling his servants to kill the fatted calf because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Unlike Jesus' parable, however, the story of David and Absalom does not end with the lost son coming home in contrition. As noble as Absalom's motive was in avenging his sister Tamar, he has some sinister plans of his own. Ambitious plans. Plans, if achieved, that would eventually anoint him as king that he might sit on his father's throne. He raises an army to conduct his coup. David flees Jerusalem with his army, And when the two armies finally meet, well, David has the more numerous 
and experienced force and prevails over his rebellious son. On the eve of the battle, David tells his three commanders, Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. Our reading takes up at this point with David's forces set to engage Absalom's army. Listen for God's ancient but contemporary words to us as I read them from 2 Samuel 18. Absalom's army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. Absalom, who was riding on a mule, happened to meet the servants of David. The mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and Absalom's head caught fast in the oak. An older version talks about his hair actually being caught in the oak. And he was left hanging between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. Joab, one of David's commanders, came upon the scene, and he took three spears in his hand and thrust them into the heart of Absalom, while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And ten young men, Joab's armor-bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then a Cushite an Ethiopian slave, came to David and said, Good tidings for my lord the king, for the Lord has vindicated you this day, delivering you from the power of all who would rise up against you. King David said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? The Cushite answered, May the enemies of my Lord and the King and all who rise up against you do, him, do you harm. Be like this young man. The king was deeply moved. David, realizing the import of the Cushite's words, went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, my son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Our tale has a tragic ending. Grief and anguish poured off David like a stream swollen by the spring rains, cascading down the mountain hillside, nothing to stanch the agony of grief. Only a parent who has lost a child can fully appreciate David's agony and his remorse. Some years ago, Ernest Campbell wrote of an incident that took place at the Bronx Park Zoo after he and his wife had visited in order to see firsthand a multi-million dollar facelift of the zoo had undergone. Only days after their visit, the sickening word came over the news that a young Bronx zoo attendant had been mauled to death by Siberian tigers. She had entered their natural habitat apparently without first determining the whereabouts of the tigers. They discovered her before she discovered them. The girl's mother, Adele Silverman, shared some of her grief publicly in these heart-rending words. It's too much for parents. If you lose your husband, you're a widow. If you lose your wife, you're a widower. If you lose your parents, you're an orphan. 
But please, someone, tell me, what word is it that describes when a mother loses a child? What is that word? Please tell me what I am. So what is David? A grieving and no doubt guilt-ridden father, to be sure. But is there a special name for that condition? For a father who loses a son? One word comes to mind. Bereft. Which literally means deprived. Deprived of a life. Deprived of a son. Deprived of an opportunity to seek forgiveness and to forgive. Deprived of the possibility for reconciliation. Deprived of a love restored. Bereft. Deprived. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann comments on our biblical story. The narrative places David's grief naked before us and allows us to watch the king probe the reality of life, the obscenity of war, the wretchedness of death. How odd that no one offers to David any gesture of healing. He is alone in this moment. No one intercedes on the king's behalf or on the king's hurt. Life can go on, but life will never go on in the same way. The narrative leaves us with the residue of grief unresolved. We, too, live in a time of unresolved grief. Over 420 million people worldwide have lost their lives to COVID-19. And now we're facing another virus, more deadly than the first strain. The scourge of these unrelenting viruses has mangled our grief processes. Too much to bear. Too many for whom to pray. So we become emotionally paralyzed, numb, our compassion crumbling like a stale cookie. We are left not knowing how to respond to this crisis, how to access our best instincts, how to comfort those experiencing loss. I was struck by a story coming out of the Olympics, not this summer's Olympics, but the ones held back in 1992, which provides an example of how to make a compassionate response to an unexpected calamity. Like many such contests, those Olympic Games were filled with both tragedy and triumphs. In one competition, the 400-meter race, the distinction between tragedy and triumph became blurred. At the start of the race, Englishman Derek Redmond popped his right hamstring a severe and excruciating injury that ends most runners' chances of finishing their race. But not Derek Redmond. Redmond got back up and started hopping toward the finish line. The other runners had all finished the race in a matter of seconds. Redmond, in tears, slowly, laboriously, painfully, kept hopping. It looked as though he would fall at any moment. Suddenly, Derek's father appeared and ran down from the stands and pushed his way through the security guards to reach his son. Redmond's father put his arm around his son and let him cry on his shoulder for a second. And then, with his father holding him up, Derek hobbled to the finish line and completed the race. We have seen similar scenarios played out in the Special Olympics, wherein a young runner falls and one or more of his or her fellow runners comes back to assist and they all finish the race together. With that kind of care and cooperation, there are no losers, only winners. In this year's Olympics, we saw Simone Biles perhaps the greatest female gymnast in history, give up her place in the all-around competition 
to Naomi Osaka, who then went on to win the gold medal. At the end, Simone hugged her replacement. Once again, though she did not compete, Simone Biles was a winner, not a loser. Where was the winner in David's moment of despair? In his sadness and in his grief, David seems to have had no friends and no God to turn to. No God to provide comfort and forgiveness. Nowhere in this extended story covering some six chapters in 2 Samuel is God even mentioned. Not once. There are no winners. And David becomes the last loser. Well, so much for David and Absalom and the prodigal son. <clears throat> this uh, tale of two fathers and two sons. Now we turn to another story. A rarely told story. Whatever happened to Tamar? Absalom's sister, who was viciously raped by her half-brother Amnon? We don't know. Her name is not mentioned again. She has slipped silently into the forgotten pages of history. Did you know that in the United States, every 68 seconds, someone like Tamar is sexually assaulted? There are approximately half a million recorded rapes each year in our country. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. We don't know the total of all forced sexual encounters, including incest. The vast majority of victims are someone's daughters. Too many of these victims are ostracized by their own families. Who will cry out for them? Who will seek justice for them? We cannot be like David and look away and pretend nothing happened. Who will advocate for today's tomorrows? We can begin by following the example of the father of the prodigal son and welcome home without judgment our violated children with open arms and understanding hearts. We can also remember the time when Jesus defended and saved a woman caught in adultery who was threatened by stoning. Surely that indicates that he would stand today with all victims of sexual violence and against those who, per who perpetuate such violence. And we can do no less. If we learn nothing else from the story of David, Tamar, and Absalom, we should understand that turning a blind eye to our children when they have been brutalized by others leads only to despair, betrayal, and sometimes to death. And finally, we can advocate for justice by following in the steps of Jesus to live our lives with love for one another. Serving God with our whole hearts and minds and very lives. Someday, may that be so. Please, God, make it so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
gladness we offer the gifts of our life and labor. The Apostle Paul reminds us to give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Since we will not be passing the offering place today, you may drop your offering plate in one of the boxes at the door as you leave, or simply go online and click uh, Give Now to make your contribution on the church's website. Please remain standing as we sing our praise to God. you have given us so much, we thank you for the opportunity to give back through your church. As you bless our offerings, may they be used to further this church's ministries and its mission, always in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And let the people say, you may be seated. Please join me in prayer. O oh God, who created us and has loved us through the centuries, who forgives our failures and cheers our successes, hear us as we humbly turn to you, offering prayers for ourselves and for others. From the time of Cain and Abel, this has been a violent world, and we have participated in that violence actively and at times silently, holding our tongues when we should have acknowledged our shame and sought your forgiveness. Yet we pause to give you thanks, 
for the beauty that surrounds us, your love that enfolds us, friends and family who support us, your presence that empowers us, and your grace that forgives us. We thank you for good health and length of days, for the promise and power of prayer that sustains us, for the Holy Spirit that guides us, and for Christ who both comforts and confronts us. Dissolve for us the semblance of any notion that we are a self-made people. Teach us the measure of our indebtedness that we may praise you more nearly as we ought. We pause to pray for this world you created, now racked by an unrelenting virus that threatens our very lives and seeks to destroy your promised future. Show us how we can motivate the hesitant to get their vaccines and overcome their doubts and their fears. Silence those motivated only by a stubborn oppositional stance based more on politics than on conviction. We are grateful for the pastoral, <clears throat> pastoral leadership of Sandra and Pat. In this time of renewal, we pray for Sandra as she pursues her studies and time with family, for Pat and his work with the youth and his support of our church's mission. And do not forget, precious Lord, to continue your blessings on this congregation as we seek to love you and our neighbors and live our lives with purpose and perseverance, seeking your guidance in all things and your blessing in all our endeavors, great and small. Finally, Lord, deal gently with the women and men, girls and boys, who through no fault of their own have been brutally and sexually assaulted. Heal their wounds, both physical and psychological, thou merciful protector of the innocent, that wholeness of body and spirit may once again prevail, and they may know the fullness and sanctity of life you intend for them. May the perpetrators of these assaults be called to account, and punishment meted out as, befit, as befits their crimes. Continue, we pray, to teach us so that we may teach our children the sanctity of life you have bestowed on us. We never tire of repeating the prayer Jesus taught his disciples that sustained them and continues to connect us to you and to your people everywhere as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
gospel charges us to be more like the father of the prodigal son than to be like David by loving God, loving our neighbors, loving our families, and loving those whom God sends our way. In that mission, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love this day and every day. Amen.